All right. Hey, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that. We are going to switch over to Steve's panel, although you're going to see him in a slightly different spot because um, this is a pre-recorded panel, um, and he will be available to answer questions as soon as the panel is over. Yep. Um, but let's go ahead and do that. Feel free to throw um, stuff in the chat as that is going, and we will check that as we come back. So let's switch over to... Japanese albums that should be on your playlists that aren't Cowboy Bebop OST1. Hi there, my name is Steve Gearhart and welcome to my panel for OnCon 7. It's actually one of two. This one is, of course, uh, anime soundtracks that you should have on your playlist but are not Cowboy Bebop OST1. So again, my name is Steve Gearhart. I run a YouTube channel called The Unagi Observer. I take a look at a whole bunch of different fandoms, mostly anime, manga, J-pop, that kind of stuff. But I, I look at other things too, sci-fi and gaming and things. So if you want to check my channel out, the, the link will be down below. Uh, since this is a pre-recorded channel, that means a couple things. Uh, one of those things means that I can't play the music on here, unfortunately, um, simply because if I do that, I don't have the rights to them, so that means YouTube will shut down OnCon 7, and we do not want that, so we're not going to do that, right? Okay, so the second thing, because this is a pre-recorded panel, I live in the city, Baltimore to be exact, and so there's ambient city noises that might come through on the mic, so you might hear some sirens, traffic, people yelling, getting murdered, you know, just the, you know, the regular city kind of stuff. So anyway, uh, if those noises come in, sorry, I apologize for that, but unfortunately there's not much I can do. Okay, so the purpose of this panel is simply just to give you a list, a subjective list, of um, anime soundtrack that I think you should have on your playlist, that you should listen to as you're walking, reading, running, exercising, whatever it is that you do during the day that you put your earbuds in and you, you know, kind of listen to the music. So all of these are coming from anime that I'm pretty sure you're all going to know or at least heard of. Uh, there's probably albums on here where you'll know kind of like the intro and the outro song at least. Um, but we're going to talk about, um, when I bring up these albums, I'm going to talk about not only the album itself, I'm going to showcase maybe two or three songs per album, uh, talk a little bit about the band history or the musician history, because those are kind of interesting notes that are relevant to the creation of the album. And of course, a little bit about the anime itself. So that's kind of what we're going to do. I'm just going to give you enough information to hopefully entice you to go onto Spotify or somewhere or YouTube, whatever, and give the album a listen and maybe, just maybe, add it to your playlist. That would be great. So the reason why I'm not going to be talking about Cowboy uh, Bebop OST1, there's actually two reasons. And the first reason is because I've already done this panel. Um, the Cowboy Boy Bebop OST1 panel. I talked about that specific album exclusively as well as a little bit of the history between, behind uh, Yoko Kano. So if you want to check that out, please go to the Anime Archaeology, uh, go into the archives, look up OnCon3, because that's what I did for OnCon3, and um, view it and, and hopefully you'll like it. Um, and if you do, go back there and watch it. Thank you. Um, so what's the second reason? Well, the second reason is very simple. This should already be on your playlist. It's Cowboy Bebop. It's the original music to the original anime series. It's Tank. How can you not have this on your playlist? Okay, seriously. If you don't have this on your playlist, give it a listen, check it out, and uh, I'm, I'm almost, I, I would be willing to bet that you will add it to your playlist. It's really good stuff. Anyway, which leads me to the next point before we go on to the albums, which is I am going to try to find a way, this is being pre-recorded, so I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to do it, but somewhere, Discord, YouTube, somewhere, I'm going to put a whole host of links to these albums. I think I'm going to be able to get you to all of them except for one, I believe. Um, and so you can listen to the music or the album in its entirety and decide for yourself because you really should give these things a listen okay so we're done with that part and let's talk about the music the music you should have on your playlist and we're going to start with a very popular anime um it well i'm just going to go ahead and say it we're going to talk about the soundtrack to 
your name. Your Name. Yes, the movie, Your Name. Who hasn't heard of this anime movie? It was the top grossing um, anime movie of all time until, of course, Mugen Train came along in 2020, but it's still up there. You say it to anime fans, Your Name. Even if somebody hasn't seen it yet, they know what you're talking about. It's a really lovely uh, movie made by Mikado Shinkai. It's a Shinkai movie, so that means you're getting quality. The animation is, is, is spectacular, usually, and um, the stories are pretty good. You get engaged. It's when they put the, when Shinkai puts a movie together, he really puts something together. It's, it's really worth watching, and, and this one was really worth watching. So if you haven't seen it yet, you should really see it. So the premise of the, of the movie, of course, is that um, there's an event that happens and a comet that streaks over Japan. And as this is happening, there is a um, a boy in a city and a girl in the country who are observing these events. And then over time and space, they switch bodies. Like, you know, like, like their minds, like the boy wakes up in the girl's body and the girl wakes up in the boy's body. And at first they're really confused and trying to navigate. And, uh, and then finally they kind of learn how to communicate with each other you know, with notes and, and texting and things like that. And it's kind of like a Freaky Friday kind of thing going on. And it's just a nice little movie, you know, where they learn each other about each other's lives. You know, he wants kind of more of a quiet, more stable life. She wants to go into the city. They want to experience these things. And they kind of switch around. And meanwhile, they're, all, they're both going towards this one tragic event. Right, they're all they're both heading that direction. They don't quite know it until the very end, and then after the event happens, eh, the sadness happens. And but then they they try to correct it, and they're given an opportunity to do that. I'm kind of being ambiguous because for those of you who haven't seen the movie, you should go see the movie. So this should give you ideas of of um, of uh, concepts of okay excitement of. Um, bittersweetness, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 the burgeoning love of two people, things like that, you know, so you get this idea, these concepts in the movie, and, you know, overlaid with a tragedy, and so you want a good soundtrack to go with that, so the, the, the Radwimps, a uh, band that I didn't know has been around as long as that they have, um, were tasked to do the soundtrack and score for this movie. Um, a little bit about the Radwimps. Like I said, I am a little bit surprised that they have been around as long as they have. I did not know that they formed in high school in, I believe it was uh, 2001. Um, they are based, they were based out of uh, Yokohama, to, um, Tokyo, Japan's <laughs> uh, second largest city, I think, second or third largest city. And, um, you know, they got together um, simply just because one of the, the founding members, Noda, was um, caught singing by one of his friends and, and his friend was saying hey we should get a band together and just this will be something we do as we go through high school um, and this, the songs that he was singing were from Oasis apparently known as a, a really big fan of Oasis and so these two guys were the core members of, of Radwins they tap you know other friends to come in I believe that the original uh, lineup was about five members and so they actually found out that they were pretty good. And uh, so they decided, well, you know, let's, <clears throat> you know, compete in our, uh, in our high school's, you know, festival, you know, music festival, which, you know, is a big deal when you're in high school. And they were very, very, very well received. So much so, in fact, that local restaurants and, and clubs would hire them to come in to be opening an acts and things like that. So they, they started to make a little name for themselves in, the, in their neighborhood and, and, and did very, very well. But, you know, they're students first, so they were just like, well, you know, we're, we all need to study and we need to crack down and, and, and we got, we're going to take our exams because we all want to go to Tokyo U, right? Because that's, that's the goal, right, of all students to go to Tokyo U. So... They put the band on hiatus, and they said, okay, we're going to go through our studying, see where we come out at the end of this. At the end of about seven months later, um, they decided to get the band back together, and only two of the members 
stayed. The other three went on to their respective careers and, and studies in, in at Tokyo U or whatever universities they went to. So they did something kind of interesting that most bands, when you're successful, don't do. They, you, you have tryouts. You have people to, to audition, and you have a process that you go through to see if they fit in the band. Well, the three members who decided not to come back to, to rejoin the Radwimps kind of felt bad about it and they said hey look we know some musicians we think they might do the do the deal with you guys so let's tap them bring them in and um that's how rad radwins reformed and, <laughs> and they brought in these other guys and it went from five members down to four members and that seemed to do the trick they grew in yokohama they they had um a really big presence in in the in, in the music uh, um scene of that city and so much so that they started pumping out singles. Like the, um, a local, um, a, a local studio said, "Hey, you know, why don't you come in and do a single?" So they do a single, put it out, sell it, and their first single um, did really well. And keep in mind, this was just locally in Yokohama. It sold. It sold about. Uh, I, I don't know how many copies sold, but they netted something like a hundred thousand yen off just the first single and all they did was just play at clubs and then go hey will you buy our, our single and people would buy it so clearly some talent there so they went through a number of years um doing this and so finally you know as they're kind of putting together albums and things like that uh you know actually going away from singles and mini albums um they got a call it was from Makoto Shinkai, and he said, I love your music. Your music is awesome. I love it so much. I'm doing this movie, Your Name. I think you would be a perfect fit. And so the Rad Wimps, of course, you know, they're just like, um, okay, sure. So <laughs> they went in, and that's how they got the, the gig to do uh, Your Name. Makoto Shinkai was already a fan. He knew about them, and he just said, I want you guys in on this. This is what I want you guys to do. This is what you need to be doing right now. And so that's what they did. Um, so, of course, when you do scores or soundtracks for a movie, sometimes you don't see the finished product before you start making your, your music for it. This was the case. They had a pretty good idea of what the script was. Shinkai had a script ready for them, had some storyboards ready for them. So they had a pretty good idea of what was going to happen. But as they were doing the music, as they were coming up with the music, um, things, the music tonally would change the script. And sometimes that would also cause changes in the script to turn around and notify them that they would need to change a song or two. And so it took them a long time f to make this soundtrack and score. And it usually doesn't take a year and a half to do that. <laughs> That's how long it took the Rad Wimps to do that. But again, as um, one of their band members pointed out, hey, making a score is kind of hard when you don't know, when you don't have the animation. So we make these songs and we have to do it right to the second. You know, we're, we have to figure that, first we have to figure out how long the segment, and how long the song has to be, and then actually compose the song to those parameters. It's not like you can just make a song and it goes, oh, okay, it's gonna be about four and a half minutes, we'll see what happens, could be five. No, if it says, if the script calls for a song that's four minutes and 30, 36 seconds, you gotta make a song for four minutes and 36 seconds. So they had a really hard time in doing that. And um, the other part of this is is that, you know, as they were doing it, they were doing two things at the same time. And what they were doing was they were making a soundtrack and they were making a score. A lot of people know about the soundtrack. The soundtrack has a lot, is, is basically their music, is their, you know, with vocals, it sounds like the band, it's, it's their music. And it's not necessarily, it was made for the movie, but it was also made for themselves as well. And it's kind of like the intro and outro songs that you would have on a regular anime. So there's about five songs. And what was interesting about those five songs is that um, they said, well, you know, your name looks like it's going to be a big hit. You know what we ought to do? Because this was after they actually saw the movie and saw their music inside of it. And they said, you know what? Americans are going to see this. We need to put this to English lyrics. So they made a specific album 
of their music with English lyrics, and it's just the five songs um, that that, are the, that people know the the the, the uh, that know the know the best, know them well, um, and so they had the five core songs that everybody knows and loves, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the score. Now, a soundtrack is different than a score. A score is um, music made directly for scenes. It is almost directed to the musicians as to this is what I want it to sound like. This is what I want it to, to feel like. This is the, this is what I'm trying to convey with the music. So it's very specific. Um, so when the Radwimps did the album, you're going to notice for the entire original soundtrack, you're going to have the five core songs and you're going to have the rest of the score. Usually scores tend to be um, big. Uh, they can be big. And they have a lot to them, like a lot of orchestral kind of things going on in there. Sometimes they can be really simple with one single instrument with just a few notes. But usually it's not um, something of a song that you would play on the radio, right? So when they went through, when you look at the score, and I want you to look at the score when you get the Radwimps, and this is what people don't really listen to. They listen to the five songs, they don't listen to the score. If you listen to the score, you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, there's some orchestral stuff to it, but it sounds like the Radwimps without the vocals. And that's kind of what you want. And it fits the movie. And these tracks really emphasize what's going on in the scenes when the the uh, the boy and the girl finally meet for the first time or there's the the you know the running scene that you always see in these kinds of movies where he's running to to catch up to her or she's running to catch up to him and you know trying to catch on the train or whatever these songs perfectly throw that throw that feeling that that movement out there to you so you completely get the scene the scene is complete and it's wonderful and it's this little segment of time and when you listen to it without watching the movie you can still kind of feel those things you can feel the excitement you can find you can feel uncertainty you can feel the um, uh, trepidation you can feel confidence it's just a really really well done album and <clears throat> I kind of am glad that they took a year and a half to try and get this done right. Because, you know, do get the five songs that they're known for, right? Do get that and listen to it and enjoy it because they're good on their own. But you should really get the soundtrack. Put this on your playlist because some of this stuff you can exercise to. It's great for reading. It's just a wonder. Or just sitting back and just... just Taking in the experience, so definitely check this soundtrack out. Um, it has its own merits. The score is amazing. So um, yeah, put it on your playlist. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about Cowboy Bebop OST one. But I am going to talk about another soundtrack that Yoko Kano did, and that was the soundtrack for Kids on the Slope. Uh, this is a anime off of a manga, of course, and the anime is just really, really nice. It's about 12, 14 episodes long. Um, it is set in Japan of 1966, and it centers around uh, these two best friends, two two guys who become friends in high school. Karu um, has been moving around for most of his life because his father is a very busy, busy businessman, and so finally Karu says, "You know what? I want to be able to go just to one high school for the rest of my you know student career, and then you know then I'll move on." And so the father obliges him and says, "Okay, live with these relatives." So he does. And on his first day of school, he just kind of wants to get through school, get it done so he can get on with his life. And he meets uh, Santaro. Santaro is kind of like the delinquent of the school, right? But he's not really a delinquent. No, they never really are, are they? So he's not really a delinquent. He's just got a lot of energy. And he's a big guy. Um, <laughs> so anyway, the anime is about these two guys um, finding things in common with each other. The first thing that they find in common is music. Uh, Karu kind of plays the piano a little bit. Santaro plays, loves to play jazz drums. He just loves to play it. Learns that uh, he knows how to play the piano. 
And, you know, first couple of episodes, he manages to talk him into coming to this record shop that's down the slope from the school. And they go into the record shop, and it turns out that the owner has an, a kind of a DIY studio in the basement. And so for the rest of the series, they kind of go through their high school career and, you know, things as, as best buddies and fellow band musicians. And so they go down there and they practice, they get better, and they make music and all this wonderful stuff. And the 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 anime actually has a, a really nice soundtrack to it. Of course, it's Yoko Kano, and it's, and it's pure jazz. So this isn't going to be something like Cowboy uh, Bebop OST 1, which has jazz, blues, and a, a bunch of other stuff that's mixed in and does crossovers with each other. This is mostly jazz. Um, so if that's what you're looking for, this is definitely a good playlist. Um, now... The anime, again, I'm going to strongly urge this, urge you to watch this anime. It is Slice of Life. There's really nothing more to what I just described. It's nicely animated, and of course the music is great. Um, so there are two actual um, original soundtracks of the same name, which is Kids on the Slope original soundtrack. The first one, and I'm going to touch on it briefly because I think I should, uh, is actually based off of the manga. So in the manga, they make several references to uh, jazz songs that they learn how to play. And these are legitimate songs made by legitimate jazz musicians. And uh, the second one, also Kids on the Slope original soundtrack, is done by Yoko Kano, and that is the jazz music that she created for the anime. Um, that's the playlist I want you to actually focus on. But in the meantime, this playlist from the manga is really kind of impressive so let's just take a quick look at the songs on those on the on the album from the manga You see why I think you should probably check out also the, the, the first original soundtrack version of this anime, it, even though it's from the manga. Um, it's pretty impressive, is it not? Uh, so you might want to check it out sometime. I'm sure it's on Spotify somewhere. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about Yoko Kano. Um, I'm not going to go through a deep dive into her history. Uh, basically, you just need to know that she was born in uh, 1963 in Sendai, um, um, Japan. Uh, she went to a lot of prestigious musical schools. She almost opted for a career in literature, but what saved the day was that a fellow classmate um, who was into drums and liked playing music knew that Yoko Kano had a very, very strong background in music. Her parents made her play the piano. She was a child prodigy. They really didn't let her listen to contemporary music of any kind, just classical. So she was kind of new to jazz. So the friend said, hey, why don't you come see us play? We're doing this thing tonight. Why don't you come over, uh, you know, the, the student council, whatever, and see it, watch us play. And she was like, okay, yeah, sure. And she showed up, listened to this band played, and was hooked like that. So her jazz career pretty much started at that point. So the best friend, or not the best friend, but a friend of hers who introduced her to jazz set her on her course. And if that hadn't happened, we might not have gotten the wonderful music that we have gotten from Yoko Kano thus, th thus far. Um, so yeah, she, she, she really delved into jazz um, right before she graduated from college. Of course, she got some soundtrack work for video games and things like that. But she also got into her first band, which is called Tengu 100%. Um, it's an interesting jazz kind of deal, um, although the lead singer sounds like a, uh, like a Japanese version of um, Larry the Lounge Singer, but it's, it still works. And this is where you see the beginnings of her 
kind of writing jazz, composing jazz, and then putting an arrangement together. And it's kind of neat to see that in here, the very beginning of it. So you can understand why when they were making Kids on the Slope, they're like, we want we want really good jazz. Look, the, the, the manga had this wonderful jazz list of jazz albums that they were emulating, trying to emulate in the manga. We need, in the anime, we need to pump that up. We, we really need to go the extra mile here. Who, who do we get? Who do we get? Hmm. Oh, Yoko Kano. There we go. So <laughs> she was a perfect choice to um, compose and uh, direct and, um, and, and play in um, for the, for the soundtrack to this anime. And, you know, her style of, of writing for anime is that she doesn't look at storyboards. She doesn't really, she might sometimes see a little bit of the script. She doesn't see really that many character designs, no animation. Like she's not, she doesn't look at that. And so she kind of gets the gist of what this project is and she runs with it and she makes a whole bunch of songs and then that way the director can go I want this one I want this one and I want that one so this soundtrack if you're a jazz lover you're gonna love this if you love Yoko Kano you're gonna love this this playlist is I don't think a lot of people give it enough credit you know because Cowboy Bebop is OST1 is so good and it just kind of overwhelms a lot of other of her other stuff that I think this gets over, overlooked a little bit. I encourage you, I strongly encourage you to take a look at this soundtrack, and I think you will want it on your playlist. Just to give you an idea, let me um, throw some, I'm going to look at my notes here, and throw some songs out there at you, and kind of give you my my my, uh, my feelings on them. One of them is uh, Chick's Diner. It's very, it's very upbeat. It's got a lot of movement. Uh, you feel a certain flow and electricity with this song. And it's and it's like a song of something like the hustle and bustle of something familiar. Like when you go into a diner, you know, it feels familiar. You know, everything seems right, even though everything's being hectic and chaotic. There's a very strong percussion in this song. The drums are very strong in this. Uh, the piano is pretty strong in this as well. But really the instrument that steals the show for this particular piece is the upright bass is just amazing and um I I, I the name of the, the bassist uh, escapes me, but Wow. Wow. It makes you actually want to learn how to play the bass. Um, the upright bass, that is. Um, and it just jams and it jam and, and it just puts you in a really, really happy place. Um, Chick Steiner. The next one is um, kind of short um, and, and it's called Transparent. And it's mostly just piano and keyboard. Um, it has a... a it has the the keyboard kind of provides this repetitive beat with notes um it's very soft but it's ominous and it's like telling story of something like gray and hurtful and, and there's something on the horizon that you're heading towards that is you know kind of like doom and there's a lot of like anticipation a lot of energy a lot of nervous energy in this and it makes you feel like um, a little bit of anxiety but it's just a slow build and it doesn't like crash or anything. It just it just slow builds and you're just like, oh God, please get it over with. But it's so good. Thankfully, it's so short. <laughs> but uh, still, it's, it's a really powerful piece. Uh, the last one I want to talk about on this one is uh, Equinox. It's another slow moving uh, piece. Um, this is definitely will remind you a little bit of Cowboy Bebop the OST one in that it's kind of like a a jazz and uh, blues uh, crossover. Um, what you hear is what seems to be a steel guitar with a bar on the front on the front so you know, to make that sliding noise. And um, there's a regular guitar playing backup rhythm to it. And in the background, you kind of hear this lilt of a xylophone. And like I said, it's a very slow moving piece. And it's the kind of piece where you, in your mind you can kind of see um, a person by themselves walking down a road uh, by themselves, maybe at twilight. And they got a wistful look on their face like maybe they're thinking of someone, um, someone they desire for. Um, you know, maybe a little, little bit of sexy, right? Um, it's a very moving piece. It's a very piece about, it's, it's a very moving piece about um, desire. And uh, but like I said, it's slow and it's kind of sexy, and you get that image in your head, and you're just like, and you just kind of groove with it. It's really, really, really nice. Um, so yeah, so that is, uh, you you really should check this out. Um, again, it's Yoko Kano's 
uh, Kids on the Slope soundtrack. Um, this is one of the soundtracks you can find pretty much anywhere. Um, but definitely take a listen to it. It's worth your time just to sit down and maybe just put the headphones on and close your eyes and just, just listen and, and just enjoy it. Like, you're really going to love it because, as, after all, this is from the musical goddess known as Yoko Kano. So enjoy it. P. Lander Z. Um, this is kind of an exception to the list uh, because they've never, to my knowledge, have done an actual song for an anime. Um, no intro, no outro song to an anime series, no soundtrack. Um, their songs are their songs. If one happens to be used for an anime, it's purely incidental. Um, <laughs> so why am I why am I bringing them up? Why am I saying to you, you should have this on, on the on your playlist. You should have some of their songs on your playlist. Um, let me start off with their with their dubious origin story. So there's actually two versions of this story. The first version um, is that they um, all of them originally came from Japan to America, like they they emigrated here. And they came from different parts of America. They came to New York City, and, and they, they met. The original lineup met and said, hey, let's have, we've got this concept. Let's put together as a musical concept and go out and make some fun songs and have some fun times and just do our thing and, and, and be good at it and be great at it. And uh, so they've been going since, I think, 1998. I'm not exactly sure when the band formed, but they've been around for a while. Um, so that's one version of the story. The other st version of the story, which um, many people believe to be true, is that they are not from Japan, and they, but they did meet in New York City because that was their landing point. See, they're originally uh, from the Z sector of the planet P-Lander, and they have come to, um, to Earth to help us prevent us from destroying our, ourselves with nuclear weapons by teaching us to rock out. So um, that is what is to be, believe, to be believed as the actual factual origin story. So they're actually aliens from another planet here to promote peace through rock and roll. So um, kind of research it, think about which, which version it is that you think is more, more appropriate. I think they're from Sector Z. That's, that's, this, is my two, this is my two cents right there. Um, <laughs> anyway, so they're a concept band, and the concept is that they are from the planet P-Lander, Sector Z, uh, to do this thing. And they make songs that are very simple. Um, they are definitely um, a, a, a somewhat of a punk, post-punk band, post-modern. Um, their stage shows are really a lot of fun. They dress up in costumes. Um, there's, and they go by color codes. So there's P Lander yellow, P Lander red, P Lander green, and they and they've had different lineups. And with each different lineup, each new member has a different color. Um, so like I believe right now it's uh, uh, the drummer's P Lander green. I believe there is a uh, the the lead singer who and lead guitarist who's still the you know one of the founders, P Lander yellow. There's the woman of the group, P Lander pink. Um, very, very exuberant. Um, she plays, sometimes she plays the bass when they don't have a bass player. And she is also backup vocals and is very instrumental in playing the flashlight. Yes, you heard that correctly. Um, <laughs> anyway, so they, they come onto the stage and they, and they have the concept out and they throw it out there to, to the folks. And they're very much audience uh, participation. So... It can be with the song itself, where you know it's kind of like a, a back and forth, where they say something, you say something back, um, you know, you sing along with the song, you know, in a certain way, um, or you do things. And they quite often, um, you know, what they'll do is they'll say they'll they'll grab somebody from the audience, one or two people, and say, "Hey, why don't you come up here?" And they'll shove them behind the drum set, or give them a guitar, or put them on the mic, and say, "Go." And while they're going, the rest of the band does their little thing on the stage, whatever it may be. And like I said, it usually involves um, the audience as well. 
So often at one of these concerts, which um, are usually in small venues, and they've you know, your usual club venues, small club venues, or they um, are in restaurants. Uh, one of the songs they'll talk about um, is a restaurant that they go to a lot that they enjoy and made a song about. Or, you know, those, those kinds of things. So what they do is they actually hand out props to people as they do stuff to go through the concert for you to play with as you're doing the concert. And, um, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a wonderfully fun experience. So, you know, like one, one experience would be that they would give you literally a, a, a aluminum pie tin and a stick and tell you just to start wailing on it. And they'll have like four or five people doing that. They maybe give other people kazoos, whatever it is. So you get the idea. Everybody's supposed to be involved. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. Um, so some of the songs that, that they have that you might want to check out. Um, so there's, so I'm looking at my notes here. Um, there is one song called So Many Mike. Um, it's a song about coming across the fact that there are so many people in the world named Mike. And and it's a really simple song. So many Mike, so many Mike. So I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm a horrible singer, but anyway, you get the idea. And there and you see shows of people holding up signs that say Mike, and they and that's part of their props. So you know they, they do the song, and it's a it's a fun little thrash song. It's not meant to be a, a mosh pit song, but it's just a fun song to move around with. Uh, another one of their songs that you should t uh, check out the the restaurant song. You know, I was telling you about the the restaurant, and it's called uh, Taco Taco Tacos. And there's apparently a restaurant called Taco YCA that they enjoy very very much. And so they did a performance there, and they decided to do the song Taco 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 YCA. It's very much a a repeat song that when you perform live, you as part of the audience are supposed to shout things back to them as they play. Uh, the video, for, uh, by the way, all the videos for these you can find on YouTube, and they're f also fun as well to watch. Uh, the last song, which is probably their most, um, one of their more produced songs, is uh, Ninja High School. And the video starts with um, Kaiju, and like this big uh, squid with that kind of looks like a guitar neck with frets on it. It's kind of hard to explain. You have to actually look at it. Um, comes into New York City, and the band, um, you know, does a Voltron thing and try to fight, and they get beat up. So they decide to go to ninja school to learn how to fight and beat the monster. So it's a lot of tropes, a lot of tropes like that. There's a lot of science fiction tropes. There's a lot of all this wonderful stuff that comes along with it. Um, I do know. I can tell you. I can tell you one little factoid about the lead singer, uh, Pulander Yellow. And that is, he likes Cabernet Sauvignon. How do I know this? Because I sold it to him the night before um, P. Landers E performed at the Otacon, 2014 Otacon Matsuri, uh, which I attended the next day. And I'm glad I did because <clears throat> not only did I see, get to see a great band in concert, not only did I get to enjoy these songs, it was a lot of fun outside in good weather, but... I got to participate, or well not participate, but actually film an example of one of their stage antics, which is humanoid bowling. Roll clip. <laughs>
Okay, so this soundtrack is not only a great soundtrack, not only should it be on your playlist, but it is one of my personal favorites of all time. Like, it is in my top ten list of, of albums, period. Like, it doesn't matter what country you're from, if it's connected to anime, whatever. It's one of my favorite albums. Uh, it's what got me into The Pillows, who I'm a very big fan of. And uh, it's just great music. So let's talk a little bit about the anime that this music is attached to. And that would be Fully Coolie or Furry Curry, depending upon how you want to pronounce it. Um, it is an anime that was kind of pushed through by Gainax and uh, and some other studios as well. But Gainax was the ones that were the lead pushers on this one. And uh, the the quality of the animation is is really pretty good. I mean, it's very clear. Like, and they use different styles per episode, but um, it's very concise, good animation. It's only the first season is only six episodes long. There's there are three seasons in the franchise, but it's the first season is only six episodes, and they are packed. They 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 are packed with concepts. They are packed with art. They are packed with um, with action. A lot of action. You want action, you're gonna get action, and it's got some. Got it pulls at your heart a little bit, and also one of the big selling points with this, as with a lot of good anime is that it has really good music behind it. So the score is really good, but it's the pillows that, that, that it's their music that really carries this anime. Um, interestingly, um, the, the pillows have been around for a long time. Um, they've been around since 1989. They formed in 1989. Um, in 1992, their, their front man, Ueda, uh, left, their original front man, they were kind of aimless for a couple of years. I think they just did club dates and that kind of thing. And then they kind of got back together more or less and decided to pump out singles, kind of start over again. And after a while, they got successful again. And people started remembering them and started going to concerts. And they said, you know, it's time to make an album. So then they made about uh, three albums at this point. And this is when Gainax came in and basically said, hey, we like your music so much that we went ahead and went to the studio and we went ahead and bought the license to use them. So <laughs> they kind of just did it. Guy X just kind of did it. And um, so the uh, the band, The Pillows, said, oh, okay. And uh, Guy X came back and said, hey, but we would like you to do, you know, a little bit more of the songs, kind of remaster them a little bit, go have them just remix them through the studio and maybe add a little to it. And uh, we'll put it to the anime. And if you could write a couple new songs to it. And the two new songs that the Pillows wrote for the soundtrack are, you'll, I think you'll uh, know the titles if you know the anime, uh, Ride on a Shooting Star, and I Think I Can. So those are the two songs that they wrote specifically for the anime. All the rest of the songs come from one of the three albums that they had done previously that Guy Knight certificately bought the licenses for. Um, now, Fully Cooley has several um, soundtracks to them. And it's the third soundtrack that you want. So the first two are fine. It's just that the first one does the first three episodes of the season. And not only the Pillows music, but also the score. And the original soundtrack number two is the second half of the season with the Pillows music and, of course, the score. Number three, Fully Cooly original soundtrack number three, is the one that you want. And that has all the Pillows songs on it and none of the score. So it's just the Pillows. Um... The music itself is direct from um, the early 2000s, so it's got that vibe to it, that alt-rock vibe to it. Um, it's pretty stripped down for the most part. Um, it is rock, okay? It's not pop or anything like that. This is rock. This is meaningful, to me, meaningful music. Um, one of the things I found interesting as I was researching this, and I'm kind of looking at my notes here... Um, all the songs used in uh, the Fully Coolies for season, uh, you know, as I say, came from the from the Pillows' previously released albums, and they re-recorded the songs for the anime. Like they played the music, they redid the music, um, so that had a cleaner sound for the anime. But they didn't do that for the vocals. They actually the vocals that you hear on original um, um, album soundtrack number three is actually the vocals from their previous albums. So they didn't do the vocalization when they remastered their songs for the anime. Uh, the only new vocals that you have are from I Think I Can and um, uh, Run a Shooting Star. 
So, yeah, that's kind of weird, but it works. And so, again, that's the one you want. You want number three. You don't want number one or number two. You want no number three. Um, so here's some songs from number three that I think, um, you know, a couple of them you'll probably know. There's one you may not know. And they just they, they just sound really good to me. So if you haven't heard the soundtrack, maybe this will entice you to um, check it out. So the first song that uh, I was listening to was um, that I want to talk about is Advice. That's, that's what it's called. It is a borderline punk song. It's very angry. Um, it's basically about a person who gets advice from his friends or her friends about a person that he likes who is bad for him, right? And the thing is, is that they, he realizes that his friends are right and that this person is not good for him. And he realizes it and he's not liking it. And he basically tells the person, you know, you need to go away from me because I want to see you again in the future. That's one of the lyrics, kind of you know, loosely translated. In other words, he's telling the person to go away, become a better person and come back to him so that they can be together again. And it's kind of a moving kind of piece where you just kind of go, it's someone who's very angry that, you know, you duped me, you made me feel this way about you, and it's making me angry because you're not a good person, and I want you to be a good person, and I want to be with you, but I can't right now, so get away. Go away. Improve yourself and come back to me. So I, that's kind of a unique way of, of going through a relationship, but then when you watch the first season of Fully Cooly, you realize that's Nauta in his reaction to Haruku. It, he's just like, oh my god, you're the worst person ever, but love you. So can you do something about the bad stuff and then come back and we can try and do something? <laughs> so anyway, it's a really powerful song. Um, the next song is one you're probably familiar with, Little Busters. Um, this is the song that is, you hear it and it's full of coolie. You know, instantly know where this is coming from, what it's attached to. It's, it's attached to full of coolie. Um, it has a definite nostalgic feel to it. Um, it kind of almost reminds me a little bit of Twang Rock, like the Gin Blossoms a little bit, just a little bit, um, in some places. Uh, this is a song about kids who are the future singing about the future, not wanting, wanting anyone to stop them. Um, it's an easy song about um, rebellion that the future generation always brings. Um, so basically the song is just like little kids saying, hey, we're going to be in control eventually. You know, it's at some point. So uh, just get ready for when we come into the future because everything's going to change. That's the rebellion. Everything you know is going to change because eventually we're going to be in charge. And so that's kind of the theme of this song. It's kind of the theme of parts of Fully Cooly where it's just kind of talking about what happened. The, the, the current generation is not doing so well and, and the upcoming generation knows it and says, once it becomes our time, then it's going to be our time and you need to step to the side. Um, very, very thoughtful, provoking stuff. Um, by the way, Little Busters um, is a term that the band, The Pillows, uses to call their fans. So just a little, little side note there. Uh, the last song I want to talk about from this album is Beautiful Morning With You. <clears throat> the thing about this song is I thought it was an instrumental because when you watch the anime, that's kind of what you get. You don't really get the lyrics. So when I you know sat down you know, way back when I saw it and I was listening to it and I was and in come the lyrics, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, it's Japanese. I should probably figure out what they're trying to say here. So I looked at the lyrics and I'm like, Wow. Wow. Um, this song is perfect for the anime. Um, but, when you, but when you get the lyrics, it slowly moves into the song and builds up in tempo. Like the song itself starts off slow like it does, and it kind of crashes towards the end. Um, and this is a very simple song. This lyrics are very simple, but it conveys such a wonderful feeling, which is that moment when you're in bed and it's morning and the sun is out and you feel comfortable in that bed and the person that that you you love is next to you and you're just kind of like this is nice i like this you know this is a good feeling to have this is something worthwhile and you want it to last forever okay 
it's a it's just a wonderful feeling that you want to keep on going you want that morning just to be that morning forever and when you realize how beautiful that song is you're just like oh <laughs> anyway it's a it's a far more powerful song than i thought it was when i first watched the anime when you listen to the song when you listen to the lyric when you read the lyrics you're gonna be like wow okay this is quality stuff um so yeah you need to check this one out this one you need to listen it's fully coolly uh, original soundtrack number three by the pillows so uh I just wanted to add one more thing to uh, to the pillows, and that is to talk about their little mascot. It's kind of messed up if, if you if you know about it. Um, so I'm going to show a picture of it, and uh, I'm going to tell you the story of how they came up with Buster Coon. That's that's their mascot. Uh, so here we go. The original doll was made out of really dirty old leather and had a real looking eye and tongue, but one of the eyes was a button, and it was displayed in a window, shaking like it was being electrocuted. We still don't know why it was and why it was there, because it wasn't in a store display window and it didn't look like it was for commercial purposes, but it just seemed like someone's idea of a prank or some artist's work that we thought was interesting. So we used it in our jacket booklet, and while we were on tour, we thought of placing that bare image on t-shirts, so we sent the picture to a designer to arrange it, and at first it looks cute, but once you get up close, it has sharp teeth like it's ready to bite any minute. So that kind of cute but kind of scary look fits right in with the pillow's music perfectly. So here is the last entry, uh, the last anime soundtrack I'm going to talk about today, and it is the soundtrack to Samurai Champloo. The album is called Departure, and it is uh, one of, I think, I believe about four soundtracks to the anime of Samurai Champloo, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but I wanted to give an honorable mention, and it is on an anime that I found intriguing. I didn't finish it, but the music was really, really awesome. And, it is, it, and, and the anime itself is about music. And um, as I was researching it, I discovered that this anime, particular anime soundtrack that I'm giving an honorable mention to, actually deserves almost its own panel. Certainly, I'm going to talk about it on my on my um, YouTube channel at some point and give it more than 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I could easily right off the bat right now talk for the next 30 minutes about this particular soundtrack so i'm just gonna throw it out there for you this is the honorable mention um and it's called uh was it mashiro no oto or those snow no snow white notes um it is an anime about shamisen a guy who plays shamisen and how he moves forward with that as a career and uh, like i said i haven't finished the anime but it's pretty good and the music is phenomenal but today we're going to talk about departures from Samurai Champloo. Okay, for those of you who are not familiar with the anime Samurai Champloo, it is very stylized. It, it's got its own style. It's got its own thing going on. But the basic plot, the basic story, is that there's a young lady named Fu, and she is kind of an orphan, but she knows that her father is alive. And through some mishaps and misadventures, these two samurai who are very much opposites of each other one is steeped in tradition you know he looks like a samurai he wears the obi the, the, the whole nine yards right and the other one kind of looks like a barbarian he's wild haired and he's just you know very crude and you know that kind of a thing going on but he's just as good of a swordsman as this other guy and through these mishaps and misadventures they get roped into helping her find her father who's the samurai who smells like sunflower seeds or something to that effect so they go on a journey through Edo Japan, or Edo period Japan, and looking for her father. Um, how this, how the anime ends is very, very interesting. And I should note that there are historical elements to Samurai Champloo which are very, very interesting and wildly inaccurate. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. But the, it's fun to watch. And um, one of the, sty the styles that you see is that it often... Uh, particularly with the title cards, it often bounces back and forth between the Edo period, uh, right after the Warring States period, and today. So you have people who are, you know, kind of moving around in Edo period Japan as if they were moving around in downtown Tokyo. It's it's kind of weird, but it also kind of works. So 
if you're going to have this kind of stylized thing going on, you want to have the right music to it. So, um, so we'll get into the album here in a moment. But uh, the anime was uh, done by the studio called Manglobe, which were guys from um, a small group of guys from uh, Sunrise, and they want they broke off and then formed their own little thing. And when Shinshiro Watanabe wanted to do another project, which everybody was excited about because Cowboy Bebop was such a big deal, they said, sure, come on, let's do it. And so Shinshiro Watanabe pretty much um, was in charge of the whole project. And he didn't just direct it, he, you know, or write or draw it or anything. He, he did pretty much everything. And he was heavily, heavily, heavily involved in the music. Manglobe originally said, okay, great, we're going to have, we should share with Hanabe, we're going to have this great anime, it's going to be quality, it's going to be a great story and everything, and we're going to have Yoko Kano coming in, doing the music. Uh, wait, wait, what, Tanabe, you said no? Wait, we're, we're not going to have Yoko Kano? Are you sure? So basically, um, uh, what Tanabe basically just said, you know, look, no, this is the thing that I want to do. I want to, I want to hip hop influence music into this. It's not that she doesn't know what she's doing. She does. She's a goddess of music. But this is what I want to do. So he kind of looked around, and he wanted to find some hip hop artists and some uh, uh, low lo fi artists, and kind of bring them together and do the soundtrack for, of course, uh, the anime. And the four major guys, the four core gr uh, guys who who were or four core. Um, personalities who did this uh, were uh, Shinji uh, Suchi Yushida, Yushida of Shaka Zombie. I don't know if you ever heard their stuff. It's pretty fun. Um, Nujabes. I, I think I'm saying that correctly. If, I, if I'm not saying it correctly, it's because my Japanese is really bad. Um, there's a, a group called uh, of two DJs called um, Force of Nature. And of course, the last person who is actually American is uh, Fat John. So these four elements pretty much uh, produced, wrote the music, uh, they performed into it, but they also brought in other artists to do the music for them and to mix it and all that good stuff. But they're the, the, the four drivers of the soundtrack for Departure. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump into some of the songs that I, that I enjoy here. Um, one of the ones I'm not going to mention is War Cry because I think everybody knows that. And while it's very, very good, it's kind of on the short side. And there's other things I want to talk about as well. Um, but the overall feel of the album is definitely a lo-fi hip-hop kind of sound to it. It's very mellow. It has uh, some funk elements to it. But it's quite different than some of the other stuff that I've been talking about today. So let's go into the first song. Okay, so the first song that I really liked um, that is off of Departure that I want to talk about is The Space Between Two Worlds. This is a lo-fi, very calm, chill, mellow jazz number. Uh, very slow tempo, very relaxing, not something you dance to. And this is definitely, you know, you sit back, you relax, maybe you got a nice drink in your hand. Uh, you know, you're just, you got your headphones on and you're kind of spacing out a little bit. So, and, and the idea of the space between two worlds is that you're in that, as you listen to the song, you actually get caught in that place where here's the, you, you're aware of the real world working around you as you're listening to this song and just kind of spacing out there. But you're also aware of what's going on in your mind, but you're also in that little bit, that little space in between where you're just kind of like going, okay, this is nice. This is where I want to be. And it's very, very relaxing. Uh, this is the kind of song that, you know, you'll probably sit in your chair, your comfy chair, like I said, good headphones on, watch, uh, listening to it, and you're looking out the window, and you're watching the cityscape, and you're just kind of grooving along with it, and um, it's really kind of cool to watch music and have this kind of view out there. So the next song I want to talk about, which is kind of fun, it's a fun song, it's uh, called Gino. And this is where you start getting some funk elements into it. So it's nothing over the top, you know, it's not like, you know, any bass slapping or anything like that. It's, but it's definitely, there's some funkitude going on there. It's pretty solid. Um, it's one of the songs where you, it makes your head not, you, 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 you bop your head to it and you don't quite realize to uh, realize that you're doing it. And maybe you're moving in your chair a little bit, doing a little bit of chair dancing, because it's just one of those things that's just a very infectious groove gets into you and makes you want to 
Makes you want to move around a little bit, but just in a nice way, just calm, very calm, just like the rest of the album. And it's one of those songs where if you have it playing in your car, you're obviously going to be, you know, moving around in your car, and the drivers who are passing here just we're going to drive by going, what is he listening to? You know, so it's just just a very very nice funk song. Um, it it doesn't last very long. It's it's only I think I think it's only about three minutes, but it's it's just a moving song. This is a, mo- a song about movement, but slow movement, purposeful movement, um, in time to what what's going on in the world around you. Great little funk tune. So we're gonna wrap it up here with Shiki no Uta. Um, so this song here is actually the outro song to Samurai Champloo, and when you get to the end of the anime, you realize how appropriate this song actually is. Don't want to spoil it, watch the anime, listen to the song. Um, it is performed by a, um, by an artist by the name of Minmi, and she, her voice is perfect for this, for this, uh, for this song. And the lyrics of this song try to put together a, the idea that of, of a relationship ending. So, and the, what they use uh, as the allusion, allusion to it, is the idea that a relationship is like seasons in a year. And so it starts off with spring, which is kind of like, okay, we find each other and everything is exciting and new. Then you get to summer where they're both comfortable with each other and they're in love and everything seems to fit really well again the fall and things kind of fade and they start to fall apart a little bit and things start to die a little bit and of course winter it's over it's done the relationship is is done and over with it's a sad song and min Mei's voice min me min me min Mei's voice is uh perfect for this and as she croons out the lyrics to this just let me give you an idea i'm going to end the panel on these lyrics of how wistful this song is. So I'm going to try to do the lyrics justice. I'm not going to sing, but I'm just going to read them out to you. The sun will rise and will bid farewell to forever. All our happiness will only be a dream. Oh, darling, won't you stay with me? Because all these seasons. There you go. Okay, so that's it for my panel. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Steve Gerhardt. Uh, I run a, a YouTube channel called The Unagi Observer. Please check it out sometime. Definitely check out these soundtracks. I think you're going to like them. And they should be on your playlist. Again, thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of OnCon. OnCon 7. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much. So there we go. Uh, hope you all enjoyed that. Um, I know I did. Found that a really interesting panel, um, all about the music. Um, and I'm glad because when when you submitted it and the title was um, Japanese albums, I, I was afraid for a moment that it was all going to be like obscure, like Japanese bands. It almost was that. Yeah. It almost was that. And it, yeah, it almost was. Um, uh, and I was like, oh, I recognize some of these things. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so obviously any questions you all have in chat, please feel free to drop them in here. Um, and, um, yeah, how do you find this stuff? Um, just like anything else, you have to research it. You have to look it up online. I'm a, a music file to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, back in the day, I, you know, my parents were like, they're musically inclined. My dad mm. actually had a, a one hit wonder back in 1963. Cool. Wow. He barely etched in into the top 100. <laughs> Hal and his pals, if you want to look at <laughs> um, <clears throat> So <clears throat> my little sister is musically talented. My older sister and I are not. Okay. Um, you know, if you ask me if I can play an instrument, I'll say badly. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> So, but, you know, we have a, a big appreciation for music, so I, I like looking at all the stuff. And there, when you watch an anime, part of an anime, uh, the hook of an anime is to actually, you know, really draw you in. And one mm-hmm. of the ways to draw you in is through uh, audio. 
And so you mm-hmm. want to make that that song that's going to go. And it's just like anything else. It's like the Friends thing, mm-hmm. from Friends. You know, where it's just like we want to grab you and we want you to associate this song with the anime and vice versa, so that way we can you know sell you merch. Yeah. And um, so when you hear the good song, you're like, okay, one, well, I'm, I'm inclined to hear the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Right. So you kind of want to listen into the, you know the rest of what what's interesting. And if you have something that's a phenomenal album, mm. I know this isn't about Cowboy Bebop, but <laughs> you know, um, well. if you hear a phenomenal album like that, you want to know. Mm-hmm. And actually, actually, I'll talk about to the, uh, to the point of the Radwimps. Mm. Like you, you go into this and you hear these songs, and they're just wonderful earworms that you don't mind having in your head. And yep. and even the score is is beautiful and, and worthwhile. And then you go, okay, I want to know more. Why did you do it this way? And you mm-hmm. go into it, you research it, and you found that and find out these neat little little nuggets of, of information, like, you know, I mean, kind of being a total fan of the Rad Whips. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a, please, please, please do an, al- please do an album for, for, for my anime. Like, it, it should be, you know, they're like, well, it should be the first. We should be going to you, begging you to let us do music for your anime because you're a god, you know. I remember, okay. he, remember hearing when Shinichiro Tanabe did um, Samurai Champloo. Right. And he wanted to do all of this hip hop, so he started calling hip hop artists right. in thing. And this was, I mean, Champlu was what early two thousands, something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. And um, he would call these people up, saying, you know, would you please do the thing? And they're like, I love Cowboy yeah, Bebop. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah. You know, yeah. I was like, Great! I had no idea. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, find these little nuggets uh, about about some of these uh, some some of these bands and somehow interesting they they can be mm. or how. Like offbeat, they can be mm-hmm. like P. Lander Z, which mm-hmm. uh, I, so uh, P. Lander Z, yeah, yeah. I sold, I sold the lead singer wine. Nice. Yeah, I was just like, well, you kind of look familiar, and mm-hmm. he wasn't dressed up at that point. I was just like, I wonder. And the next day at the Mitzvah, I'm just like, he likes Cap <laughs> So you know, it's, it's, it's always fun, you know, having that and Absolutely. having those connections, mm-hmm. um, like kids on the slope. Like when I saw that on. I, I see it on fun animation. Mm. I think I think it's what it was. I was just like, oh, okay, what's this about? I really don't know. I've heard about it before. Mm. Yoko Kano did the soundtrack. Okay, we're watching this. Mm. Ball. <laughs> yeah, we listen to it, and then you find out, you know, of course, that there's multiple soundtracks, and that's mm. the other part of this. Is, mm. that, is that there's so many different soundtracks. This mm. Fully Cooley has upteen billion soundtracks mm. to it. Mm-hmm. So you know, you have to find the one that you want to focus on. Yeah, and you know, this of course was number three. Mm. And of course, the pillows themselves. Mm. Then you look into the pillows again. It all—it just all comes into mm-hmm. it. It's just all about research. Just yeah, and enjoying it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it's also so interesting because with so many anime soundtracks, it's you know they hire a composer who does twenty tracks to you know just kind of fill it out. Um, but then you have those kind of passion projects right. um, where it's just so carefully integrated into everything. Um, that just kind of you know it makes it really special, um, uh, and you get like the weird soundtracks. One of my favorites is um, His and Their Circumstances, which is it's a '90s anime, but it's all kind of like '60s sitcom music, right? Um, and it's just so bright and happy and cheerful. And then like there'll be like you know strings and all sorts of you know uh, emotional stuff, but it's nothing like any other soundtrack of the time. But it, it you know, and that makes it fit perfectly, right, right. you know. Well, <clears throat> when I was watching Radwimps, um, or watching, you know, um, the, the anime there, and uh, your name, and mm. you're hearing the, the Radwimps, and then suddenly hearing English, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> sounds good, but wait a minute, yeah, you know, and the idea that you know, here here's a song that was made, was it? Uh, your name came out when? Two thousand. Oh, thirteen? Maybe. Yeah, twenty thirteen. Mm-hmm. But it's a song that if you if you if you've been around for a little while like me, <laughs> um, back you know back in the day in the '90s and early 2000s, mm. that's that's what music sounded like. Mm. You know, alternative mm-hmm. music sounded like that. So yeah. I was just like, so when I was listening to that and I'm watching this anime, mm. beautiful rendered anime, 2013 anime, and I'm mm. just like, like, this is an old style of music. Yeah. Into this, mm-hmm. and I was just like, but I like it. Mm-hmm. But I like it. It's good. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's and it's really nice when they when it, an artist when a musical artist can get together with a producer mm-hmm. and you know that's why Shintaro Watanabe is really successful with his music ventures because mm. you know he's he actually produces music for a lot of other animals. Uh, okay. And he's really into music. I mean, mm. He's really into it. <laughs> 
I couldn't so, tell. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so he goes after the best out there. Mm. And, um, and so, you know, when you have somebody like that, you have people willing to work work with that. Yeah. Then you, you get something crazy magic. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point because you want the anime to be successful. Mm -hmm. what's, part of, what's part of it? Have you ever, well, I forget who said it, but somebody said, have you ever tried watching a movie without music? Mm -hmm. And you realize that music adds that whole other dimension to what's going on. Yeah. You know, a, yeah. you know a, a single note for a character. I remember somebody saying that you know, um, uh, if you think music isn't isn't um, isn't important to to the film experience, remember that music predated audio on film. Right. You know, they they even like just added music to silent film. Right. Because it needed it. Right. Like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have somebody saying they're just going. <laughs> I need a sense of foreboding. <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna cut it. You, no. you, you need some music there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, yes, yeah, so we have a question in the chat. Um, are there any anime soundtracks that you per personally suggest getting the vinyl records or streaming it? So, they're, they're like worth owning, worth worth, worth owning, mm -hmm. um, or, or worth you know. I would say uh, Kids on the Slope. Mm -hmm. of, of the ones that, that, that I showcased here. Kids on the Slope, uh, definitely, um, because it's Yoko Kano, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, honestly, and her, her stuff is gold, and she's mm -hmm. just, she's a guy. Yeah, mm -hmm. a yeah. So there is that. Um, <clears throat> I would tell you Radwins, the, mm -hmm. the, your, the your name soundtrack. Yeah. Um, simply because it's, even the score, with the songs within the score, mm -hmm. each little song, whether they're a minute or 30 seconds or mm. four minutes long means something and have something that are important mm. and, and they're worthwhile having. Um, there's a lot of anime out there that have the one or two songs and mm. that's it. Mm. You mm -hmm. have your intro, your outro, and that's yeah. they're, they're, they're fine with that. Mm -hmm. Like for example, like uh, DNA Squared, the best the best part of that anime is the song. Larkin sells glory. Uh, well, I, I mean, yeah, and that's the intro there's a low bar, but yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know you have but you have things like that or I would say the soundtrack to uh, uh, Full Metal Alchemist mm. not Brotherhood but the other one okay. the, yeah. the one that, first, that came first out yeah. first came out which if you get the old CD by the way mm. it comes with oh gosh what, what is her name she does she did one of the outro songs um, but it actually has a video too that's oh, to, cool. to that song on it uh, so you can play it on, on DVD nice um Pretty much, um, if you can find, honestly, if you can find anime that has more than one good song to it, mm. get you know it's it's worth having, worth streaming, mm -hmm. or worth going to. <clears throat> well, that's the other part of it is is that one of the hard things about that, particularly with Japanese music, is mm. um, when it goes on moratorium because mm. a lot of the stuff goes on moratorium, which means that they stop making it for a while. Yeah. So you're gonna wind up paying like. 40 bucks yeah you know for, mm -hmm. for for a soundtrack but if you really like it yeah it yeah that would be my advice like if if you like the soundtrack and it is available um seriously consider snapping it up because yeah. it might not be there it's and it's like, like you know, to that point it's not like anime where there, it's necessarily going to be on streaming forever like right. it bounces in and out so yeah yeah it's it's, it's worth having and as far as vinyl is concerned mm. Um, I would only get vinyl if you're doing a score composition, meaning, mm. uh, you know, like with the Radwim Stin, that was not their songs, mm. you know, the vocalizing or anything, but just kind of, you know, those, those scores to the music <clears throat> and anything jazz really like Yoko Kano stuff, mm. um, or, you know, things of that nature. Vinyl does very well with that type of music, uh, okay. but it doesn't do very well with, with current day mm. um, music. So if you like, if you were to watch, um, the world is mine. Um, God, what is the name? Uh, Kerplunk or something like that. Mm. Uh, Japanese band. It's just, it's just the one song they do. Mm. When you actually listen to it on vinyl, it doesn't work. Um, mm. It's, it's kind of weird, just because it's a, it, it, it has to do with the studio engineering. Mm -hmm. by the sure. Way. Yeah. So vinyl has a certain quaintness to it mm. that mm -hmm. works with classical and jazz that it doesn't mm. work with, with current music. Interesting. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and it's hard for me too because like there are certain soundtracks that I adore, but um, uh, the Kenshin OVA or only Kenshin original OVA soundtrack, for me that's that that is an absolute classic. But because it's an OVA, 
every piece of music in that, I can see the scene right to that exact song. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, <clears throat> actually, I just I just thought of one and almost made the list for this this mm-hmm. video. The soundtrack to the Wings of Hanamazi. Oh, okay, um, yeah. Because that is Sakamoto, mm. who did the who who did the soundtrack to the Reverend to the Reverend, which was the Leonardo, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie oh. where he won the Oscar. Yeah. So he does a lot of soundtrack stuff, and he did. Uh, he was really big in the early '80s with uh, Moog. Oh, okay, like, yeah. yeah, stuff like yeah. that. So uh, it, a lot of electronic music today mm. is based on what he did in Japan. Wow. Uh, like he and you know, a couple others. But mm-hmm. yeah, he's one of the pioneers of that. But if you get the wings of Hunter Maisie, that's an excellent score to have, mm-hmm. particularly on vinyl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And anything Yoko Kano? Yeah. Just like Yoko Kano. For me, that's yeah. just yeah, all that's the way through. Um, boy, when 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 someone gets her back for an anime project, the world's gonna explode. Yeah, it's it's the gonna be gonna amazing. For those not familiar, Yoko Kano did the soundtracks too. Escafone, Macross <laughs> Plus, Cowboy Bebop, Turn A Gundam, you know, Kids on the Slope, all sorts of stuff. Okay. And she has since moved on from the anime industry to do things like the coronation suite for the new Japanese emperor. Which was very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, God, you know, as we were, we're talking about this, I, mm. I, I'll keep coming back to the one question. Yeah. Um, Cream Puff. Yoko oh, yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. So that's, that's from um, the, one of the Macross shows, the, yep. the, the one that we watched here yeah. on, on the Weekly Dig. Um, <clears throat> that one is, is a good, that, that's mm-hmm. solid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, was just, I was listening to that, I was just like, oh, yeah, it's a pretty good mm-hmm. colors. <laughs> sure enough, oh, yay. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. She, oh, we, I saw her at uh, Yoko Kano. Mm. Um, was it 2013 Otokan? Oh, okay, yeah. Where they, where they maxed out the beasts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I saw that, and she did, for those of you who, who mm. unfortunately didn't get to see that, she did the show. She she played elements from Escafone, mm. Cowboy Bebop, and all that stuff. She played started off with the with the national anthem. She played that. Oh, album. wow. And she had the piano set up so that the, the board was up, and there's, you know, as the more you clap, like, more hearts would rain down. Cool. You know, kind of a thing. And of course, she doesn't speak very, very good English. So, yeah. you know, whenever the crowd is, like, really responsive, she, you know, she would turn around and do a little yeah. work. And when the, the theme song of Escapolone came on, she mm. did the whole crowd was like, so awkward singing. She, uh. was just like, she was so happy. <laughs> and she did two encores, but the thing was, was that she wasn't planning on doing two uh. encores. And so she kept playing the same thing. So yeah, 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 we, got, yeah. we got to hear Tank, like, three times. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was, and I'm sure no one was complaining. No. no. <laughs> yeah, again. Yeah, again. exactly. <laughs> cool. All right. We're going to switch over to a uh, um, another video about Japan. We will be back in about um, 12 minutes or so with Anime Conspiracies. Ooh. So we will see you then. We will be back in a bit.